Good afternoon. My name is Carissa Deming, coming to you from my bedroom, and I'm thrilled that you're joining me for a rather non-traditional defense of my honors capstone project. My project is titled An Analysis and Visual Interpretation of the First Movement of Anton Webern's Concerto for Nine Instruments. The goal of my research was to create a geometric interpretation of this first movement of Anton Webern's Concerto for Nine Instruments. And I hoped that my geometric interpretation would allow for a more complete understanding of the symmetry of this work, but in a more visual and geometric way. I also hoped that my interpretation would allow musicians and non-musicians alike to appreciate the complex theoretical and technical elements that Anton Webern interwove in this piece in a really fun way that's really approachable and understandable to listeners of all backgrounds. Anton Webern was born in 1883 and met his rather early and untimely demise in 1945. He was an Austrian composer and conductor who was especially known for his utilization of 12-tone theory, his innovative organization of musical elements, and his reconceptualization of traditional musical forms. He studied with Arnold Schoenberg and was a member of the Second Viennese School. Although he was incredibly prolific, he only published around 31 works in his lifetime, which when added together, equates to only around three hours of music, simply because of the condensed and concise nature of his compositions. His Concerto for Nine Instruments is considered by most to be one of his masterpieces. It took nearly four years to compose before finally being completed in 1934. And as you can see, it's written for a rather unusual assortment of instruments. It's written in three movements, and my project specifically focuses on the first movement. This piece is particularly fascinating as it combines both set theory as well as 12-tone theory. While Webern draws upon the aforementioned modern compositional techniques, he also utilized a much older form in order to structure the first movement of this piece. As you can see, this piece is in the classical sonata form has an exposition with a first theme, a second theme, and a closing theme, followed by a development, a recapitulation, and even a coda. Most musicians should find some comfort in Webern's use of the classical sonata form, as this musical formula of composition has been around for hundreds of years and was used by many of the greats like Mozart. While Webern does utilize the classical sonata form, his work sounds quite a bit different than Mozart and his peers, and this is due to Webern's utilization of 12-tone theory. 12-tone theory is a system of composition that was pioneered by Arnold Schoenberg, and through this system he sought to methodically equalize all 12 pitch classes, or all 12 notes in an octave. In this system, all notes are assigned a numerical value, 0 through 11, rather than the more traditional A through G. And this system is built upon three principles. Each composition is based on a pre-compositional ordering of 12 pitch classes by the composer. The order of these pitches is totally up to the composer's imagination. But this ordering is called a series or a tone row. And it's the primary tone row that the entire piece is based upon. The second principle is that no pitch class may repeat until all other pitch classes have been sounded. So each note in the octave must be played at least once before any of them are repeated. The only exception to this rule is in the case of certain ornamentations or pedal points. And third, there are four basic transformations the initial tone row can undergo. First, it can undergo transposition and there are 11 transpositions of the prime tone row. Additionally, it can undergo retrograde, and this is the reverse order of all 12 transpositions. It can also undergo inversion. 
An inversion is the mirroring of each interval of each of the 12 transpositions. And finally, the tone row can undergo retrograde inversion. And retrograde inversion is the reverse order of each of the 12 inversions. As I mentioned, 12 distinct forms result from each of the four different transformations, resulting in 48 distinct row forms. Often composers organize these row forms into a 12 by 12 matrix. As you can see in this matrix, several different symbols are used to indicate which transformation we're discussing. P is used to indicate the prime form. R is used to indicate a retrograde. I is used to indicate an inversion. And RI is used to indicate the retrograde inversion. The subscript X that accompanies all four of the symbols simply indicates which transposition one is discussing. Webern also utilizes set theory in the first movement of his concerto for nine instruments. Set theory allows music theorists to study, analyze, and categorize musical structure in terms of unordered collections of musical objects. Essentially, it allows them to categorize and describe the relationships between these musical objects. Webern utilizes set theory in this particular piece by grouping pitches in sets of three notes, and typically he does this via rhythmic means. As you can see, all the sets that I circled are beamed together or have brackets or are rhythmically connected in some way. This utilization of set theory is consistent not just through the first movement, but through all three movements of Webern's Concerto for Nine Instruments. Interestingly, Webern's utilization of set theory is interwoven with his use of 12-tone theory. This piece was composed using a 12-tone row, and this particular row is rather unique as it's a derived row. And this means it's a tone row whose entirety is constructed from a segment or portion of the whole. And this particular row is built using four derived sets. And this results in invariance which essentially means that certain properties of a set or a tone row are preserved under any operation or transformation. In this particular case, the intervallic content is the property that is preserved. If you look at the first tone row in the first movement of Webern's Concerto for Nine Instruments, you'll notice that the first note is a B, the second note is a B flat, and the third note is a D. This set consists of a minor second, a minor third, and a major third. The second set in this first tone row consists of an E flat, a G, and a G flat. Unsurprisingly, as this is a derived set, the intervallic content is identical to the first set. The third set, which occurs, consists of an A flat, an E, and an F which once again contains the same intervallic content. And the final set consists of a C, a C sharp, and an A. As with all of the sets that preceded it, it contains the same intervallic content. This consistency of intervallic content not only exists within the first tone row, but also exists in all other tone rows in this piece, and in fact, in the entire matrix, which accompanies the prime form of this row. And this intervallic content creates a unique symmetry, not only in each set, but also in each tone row, but further, it creates symmetry within the entire matrix. This symmetry, as I mentioned before, is a result of the derived nature of the original tone row, and the result is a unique symmetry found between these eight tone rows in the matrix. Essentially, they create a closed set of transformations. In order to create my geometric interpretation, I also had to utilize a harmonosphere. A harmonosphere is a clock-like diagram consisting of 12 numbers, 0 through 11, placed equidistant around a circle. Each pitch is assigned a number, 0 through 11, and lines drawn between points indicate the intervallic harmony between the two connected notes. For instance, if you drew a line from C to D or from 0 to 2, one could calculate the intervallic distance between those two notes as being two half steps. Therefore, harmonospheres serve as a fantastic visual representation of the symmetry or asymmetry that occurs in tone rows or chords. 
Specifically, I used harmonospheres to indicate the symmetry found in the trichords and tone rows of Webern's Concerto for Nine Instruments. As I worked to accomplish my project, there were quite a lot of steps between analyzing the piece and creating the geometric interpretation. First, I had to label all the pitches and sort them into the tone rows by identifying the sets. And then I had to label all these tone rows. Then I had to create a digital copy of the matrix. I also had to create my own harmonosphere upon which to build my shapes. Additionally, I had to catalog the tone rows. I even spent some time exploring the mathematical properties of the matrix before creating the shapes which accompany my video, which serves as my geometric interpretation of this piece. All in all, while it was fun, it was quite an extensive process. My geometric analysis features a minimum of eight images per tone row. The first four images which accompany each tone row are representative of the four individual trichord sets which occur in each tone row. In the instance of tone row 44, I have an image for set one, an image for set two, an image for set three, as well as an image for set four. These four images show the sets as separate entities and allows one to see that all four sets are symmetrical in their inner valet content. The remaining four images show the progression of the four trichord sets in each row. In tone row 44, we have set one, sets one and two, sets one, two, and three, and sets one, two, three, and four. These images allow one to focus on the symmetry of the entire row, rather than the symmetry of the individual sets. As I completed my geometric interpretation, I found that certain tone rows required additional images in order to illustrate several of the unique features found in this work. These mirror builds occur two times within the first movement of this work. The first occurrence is in tone row one and tone row two. As you can see, if you look at the figure, the order of tone row one is BA2, 376, 845, 019. And the order of row 2 is 2AB, 673, 548, 910. Now if we focus on the fourth set of each tone row, in tone row 1, set 4 reads 019. Or geometrically, 011990. And if you look at tone row two, the final set reads 910, or geometrically 911009. Essentially, the fourth set of tone row two is a mirror image of the fourth set of tone row one. And this mirroring is not exclusive to the fourth set. Each set in tone row two is a mirror image of its corresponding set in tone row one. For each mirror build that occurs within this piece, I created around 12 additional images in order to illustrate this fascinating feature. In addition to the mirrored sets in tone row one and tone row two, Fabern also chooses to use mirrored rhythms. In tone row one, as the sets progress, the rhythmic durations increase. However, in tone row two, each subsequent set features a shorter rhythmic duration. In this way, the rhythmic durations of tone row one and tone row two mirror one another. Another unique feature of this work, which required me to create additional images, is the overlap of tone rows. As you can see in this figure, all the overlapping pitches are indicated in red. An overlap is where two tone rows share pitches or overlap. For instance, if you look at tone row eight and tone row nine, the first six pitches of tone row eight are unique and don't overlap with anything else. However, the last six pitches of tone row eight overlap or are the same and shared by the first six pitches of tone row nine. However, the last six pitches of tone row nine are completely unique and don't overlap with anything. 
All of the overlaps, with only one exception, occur only at the beginning or the end of a row in this piece. And movement one features 19 separate instances of overlap. The one instance of overlap that is unusual is found in tone row 48 and tone row 49. In tone row 48 and tone row 49, the overlap which occurs between these two rows is obviously not at the end nor at the beginning. Rather, it's more towards the middle of the row. As I was working to create my geometric interpretation, these overlaps definitely posed a challenge. After some careful thought and quite a bit of experimentation, I found that tone row overlap was best expressed through bolded lines as I was creating the triangles which represented the overlapping sets. So I thought I'd provide you with an example of what these more bolded overlapping sets look like. One of the easiest illustrations is the overlap between tone row 8 and tone row 9. This is the first set for tone row 8. This is the first and second set for tone row 8. This is the first, second, and third set of tone row 8. And if you'll notice, the third set, or the green set, is far more bolded than either the first or second set, indicating that while it's the third set of tone row 8, it's also the first set of tone row 9. Now we can see all four sets, set 1, 2, 3, and finally set 4 of tone row 8. The fourth set, indicated with the purplish blue line, is also more bolded, as it is not only the fourth set of tone row 8, but also the second set of tone row 9. In tone row 9, the first set is also bolded, because remember, it's the third set of tone row 8. Correspondingly, the second set of tone row 9 is also bolded, as it is the fourth and final set of tone row eight. However, set three and set four of tone row nine are not bolded, as they do not overlap with any other rows. The same is true of set one and two of tone row eight. They are also not bolded, as they do not overlap with any of the preceding tone rows. Here you can see the entire progression of the two tone rows and their overlap, starting in figure 9 with tone row 8 and progressing to the end of tone row 9 in figure 16. Between the mirror builds and the tone row overlaps and just the general nature of how many tone rows there are within this piece, believe it or not, it took more than 700 images to create an accurate geometric interpretation of this piece but I'm thrilled to say that the end result is absolutely worth it. This video allows my geometric interpretation to accompany the piece in real time so you can see the sets and the tone rows as they happen, which in my opinion is pretty cool. So I hope you enjoy this short clip of my interpretation of Anton Webern's Concerto for Nine Instruments. Throughout the course of this project, I did encounter some obstacles, which is to be expected. The first obstacle I encountered was the lack of research and the minimal body of literature surrounding this piece. The second obstacle I encountered is that I also had to make some decisions involving technology. I had to decide which programs would best suit my needs as I was creating my geometric interpretation of this piece.
Throughout the process, I also discovered that there's definitely further research to be done, especially regarding the mathematical properties of Anton Webern's matrix. Through my research, I was only able to scratch the surface of the fascinating mathematical properties of this matrix. And I'm left with so many questions that I hope other researchers will pursue in the future. Although the original goal of my project was to create a geometric interpretation by which non-musicians and musicians alike could learn more about, understand, and even appreciate this work. I've discovered through the completion of this project that there are far more applications than I originally thought or even intended, one of them being pedagogical. Now, I realize that my shapes and my geometric interpretation is a fantastic tool for music theory professors and teachers alike my hope is that my research will provide them with a new and fascinating way to explore not only this piece, but also other pieces that use the same theories and techniques. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed exploring my project as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. If you have any questions, feel free to comment. Once again, thanks for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day.